welcome to another edition of Bistec on Ghana Web TV, where we bring you an exclusive package of compelling interviews and business stories that made headlines during the week. My name is Na Oyo Kwote. The people who make up photographic community are our eyes to the world. From selfies to never-ending Instagram feeds, the world is drowning in images. But how is traditional photography faring in the face of mobile phone photography? Well, Ghana Web Business spends time with the team lead of Jema Photography, Kweku Dakujima. My Our colleague, Desmond Frimpon, has the details. Stay tuned. Gone are the days when traditional photographers were only go-to sources whenever we needed anybody to help us capture those memorable moments. But now with the advent of smartphone technology, that particular script has been rewritten. Check this out. There you go. Whilst the digital camera has come on by leaps and bounds, it simply cannot compete with the ease, convenience, in-device editing as well as instantaneous uploads that a smartphone can offer. Today we engage the team lead of Gemma Photography, Kweku Dako, on how smartphone technology has disrupted traditional photography. Kweku Dako is the team lead of Gemma Photography and actually you're also the founder, right? Yes. Yeah. You're welcome to Base Tech on Ghana Web TV. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. But I was very impressed when I went to your social media hangout to find out your amazing work and they were super mind-blowing. How do you do them? Uh, thank you so much. Um, basically, I mean, it's photography we, we are into and that's what we do, we enjoy, we love to do that. So it's basically um, we doing what we love. Yeah. Um, that's nice anyway. Um, COVID is still around, how is it um, affecting business? Because I, I went on your social media hangout and I saw that still people are doing great stuff. <laughs> well, yes, um, I think that um, in this day and age where, we, I mean, there's COVID and all those things, um, some way, somehow, it's, it's boosting our business because we realize that even more than ever, people want to digitalize everything they want to be online they want to do things online and in in order to represent your business online you need to um, show pictures you need to show videos and all those things so in a way um, I mean at the beginning or at the early stage of COVID it hit us because of the lockdown and all those things and most businesses were affected including yeah. us but then um, the post covering. I mean, after the whole restriction and all those things, um, things are turning up even better. And uh, we are getting in contact with more people, more businesses. Everyone wants to be online just so that they can connect to people, not through physical means, but then through, you know, the digital um, day and age in which we are. Great. We see your work. A lot of people know the name, but a lot of people really don't know who you are. Are you able to tell us a little about it? We want to put it out there that it's a team, it's a group of people who have come together under one vision to be able to uh, produce these amazing works. Yeah. Great. So how did it even start at all? Um, well, it started um, somewhere... <laughs> well, it started somewhere in 2012, um, 2013. It, it, it started as a passion. For me, it started as a passion. Um, I just wanted to know more about photography, learn more about pictures. So it started way back when I was in um, uni in level 200. Um, so um, along the line, um, things got serious that um, people started contacting us for work and all those things. And then gradually we were able to get people to join us along the line in 20. 15 2016 that was when jima studios um was official jima studios that's when we registered the business and we started getting people on board and building a team and having you know all these things that we are doing now yeah so it started 
from there so it started as a hobby and now it is a business okay so after school um that was when i but wait, what where did you study at all did you do anything related um, to photography no no not at all i did economics and information studies so it definitely didn't have anything to do with um photography or art but then i think that it is more innate um than you know it's more in me than um what i studied <laughs> i'm really particular about the part that you said you were in school you studied economics and information studies like yeah. really tough courses i was yeah. in the university of ghana myself <laughs> so i can attest to, to to the content of the course that you studied yeah. so after school and you decided to do photography a lot of people think photography it's hobby hobby why would you go to school learn hard write all the eyes the hard eyes and put the certificate aside and come and do photography how did your parents react to it it's not a hobby rather than yeah. a business okay so um that was in 20 um 20 14 yes 2014 2015 when i decided to you know go into photography full time i wasn't only doing economics i was doing accounting at ica and all those things so you know in their mind they they, they saw an accountant <laughs> you know someone working in the bank and all those things wearing his suit and tie and then all of a sudden you decide to um do photography <laughs> and my mom i remember my mom asking me this it was like ah so are you going to lie on the floor take pictures uh, for the rest of your life i was like no <laughs> i'm not going to do that i mean i mean clearly they couldn't see the vision that i had and so it was very difficult for them to accept it we had a series of meetings back and forth but one thing i noticed was that my dad never uttered a word he just kept looking at me and and they all were just looking at me till they saw that oh the guy is doing something different from what everybody is doing and um we started making some small income here and there and i was very open to them so whenever i make money i send it to my mom to keep for me i don't know why i did that but after a while she was like no this thing are you sure it's this thing you're yeah, doing do uh -huh, you know so after a while then they gradually stopped and it ended there and they even started supporting uh my dream and sort of like investing in me in a, for a while and all those things so i think that it was it was difficult for them but then gradually when they saw the fruits and the results coming forth now they decided to help me and then it's been a good journey um so far i i know that they are very happy and proud of me so what about starting your photography business you know you would need cameras you need other equipment that will help you grow how did you secure it was it out of personal fans was it probably someone that's your f uh, camera you know that, that that thing okay so um for me uh my first camera i had to empty my account to buy that after that time it, i had about eight um thousand eight hundred cities in my account and i we got this move on tonaton so we were like oh I need to buy this camera so i had to empty the account at that time i was in school i was a student and i was saving a little bit from the money that my dad would give me and i had to do, i had to do i did other businesses too um, so i i emptied the account to buy the camera now when i bought the camera i realized that i can't use the camera why because i don't have a memory card <laughs> uh, i don't have a lens so I was like, oh, I thought once I buy the camera, set. I'm set. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to, the camera had to lie down for like a month. I had to save up a little money and then also get um, the memory card and then the lens to start shooting. So, Gemma, I've heard you have rich clients, like creme de la creme people <laughs> patronizing your business. But before we delve into who those people are, I would want us to go for a quick break and when we come back we're talking about his clientele as well as one interesting thing about traditional photography now. I mean in the face of smartphone technology. Don't go anywhere.
welcome back from that short break like i said we're going to talk about his clients of i've heard some and i've seen some pretty pretty people rich people all over his social media hangout Jama, tell us who are your clients because we hear top people in the country they are all doing business with you <sighs> i don't know how true that is <laughs> i don't know how true that is but um you know the thing is we we are given our best and even the bible says that your gifts will bring you before kings so it's only natural that um people at that level want to you know associate themselves with us and um you know patronize our services and our products that we are producing so we we do have quite um we've worked with quite um a number of people you know top people but then i want to say this <laughs> because it's with our business model our target is not the lux market okay. Okay. that comes as a plus right. on an average how many events are you able to have probably in a week in a month you you tell me how you do your work um so usually our busiest months will be um december and then january and in december alone we can shoot in a month we can shoot about 30 events um in in a month but then i mean that is way way high because on the average i mean for most photographers we'll do about four or five events i hear you're very expensive let's say i want to book you for for a session what are your charges <laughs> um we are not that expensive <laughs> um i think that we 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 usually will charge based on the number of hours we are spending so we do have per hour rates and depending on um, the type or the nature of the job it's between 350 cds up to about 750 cds per hour uh -huh. so, so what's the highest gig ever the highest gig ever as in in terms of um uh, the high the highest um job we've yes, done yes. that we've been paid um that will be um about 60 70000 one other challenge that really interests me in photography business is the advent of smartphone technologies you know before i would probably look out for the nearest photo studio and go and take a picture but now with my phone I just take a picture and I'm good to go. Mm. How has the smartphone technology um, disrupted photography business? I mean, traditional photography business. Um, well, you see it as a disruption, but I see it as an opportunity. Now more than ever, picture is on the lips of people. I mean, at every point, whenever you walk into an a particular area where you see people talking if you are careful to listen to them you hear picture mentioned one out of ten I mean it's and so it's making photography even more popular and 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 once they use their smartphones and they are unable to achieve what we are producing out there they are like oh then we then for professional photography is not easy it's not easy. That's how come we can organize a workshop for um, photography enthusiasts who are using their phones, make money off them, still teach them new stuff, and then they learn like, oh wow, I didn't know this, oh I didn't know this, and they tend to appreciate photography even more. Now whenever um, they come to the professional and they want to um, employ their services, they know that photography is not easy. They are used to photography. They are exposed to pictures. They know the value that comes in terms of pictures and all those things. And so they are appreciating our work even more. At first, you know, photo is not like it wasn't. It was never a big deal exactly. until like six years from now. People will not say, will not go out and say, "Oh, I'm going to take, um, oh, photos. I'm paying." up to 10,000 CDs for pictures, why? You know, all those kind of things. But now, more than ever, we are in a digital world where photos are popular. And so everyone wants the best photo. And to, if you want the best photo, you need to get the best photographer to take those things. So it has made pictures popular. 
And so I don't see it as, you know, the downside of it. And, and in terms of professionalism and the kind of output professionals bring compared to um, the phone, um, there's a lot of difference. Okay, so talking about um, comparing smartphone technology um, photography to traditional or yeah, traditional photography, which is I stand there, you put your camera at me and then you yeah. take a shot. Is there any competition at all? There's no competition at all because for professionals, there's a lot of um, creative thinking that goes into the entire process before I photograph you. And so um, it, it, with the, it's, it's, it's more like me, a layman, holding a basketball compared to um, Michael Jordan holding a basketball. Now, we are holding the same basketball, but in, Michael jo in the hands of Michael Jordan, that is worth about $20 million, $30 million. In the hands of me, it's worth the price of the f um, basketball, which is about 100 cities. You understand? And so, um, what Michael Jordan can do with the basketball, I cannot do as a limo. It's the same thing. What I can do with, a, with your phone camera in my hand will be so, you know, high and different from what you can do with your just because of the skill sets um, the kind of creative process and thought process that goes into my mind before taking a picture um, you know in terms of the planning in terms of the posing in terms of the elements I introduce into the picture in terms of me coming to sit down and do some edits and manipulation on the pictures and then bringing it out, bringing it out to you um, it will be way different from what you will do and what you be at the end of the day produce as a picture, yeah. Then obviously you don't see it as a challenge at all. Never a challenge. I'm actually making money off <laughs> what you guys are doing. <laughs> all right. So, have you got any advice for anybody listening to us that would want to do photography? Well, I think that put in, in as much as photography is um, a hobby for many people, and it's passion driven you know um if you want to enter into photography as a business i think that you need to be able to run it as a business not a hobby most people are doing hobby and they think that that should produce income or some level of um, growth in terms of business for them but then it's photography as a business is entirely different from um, photography as a hobby. It's just like um, Stone Boy having a management to run his music business and then um, I mean people are there who can really sing like maybe me I can really sing even better than Stone Boy but I'm doing it as um, a hobby and I sing in the ch in church and all those things or people invite me to their weddings to sing but I'm not doing it as a business once you want to do it as a business you need a management you need some um, some form of uh, business model and all those things so that you'll be able to run a successful business and at the end of the day you say that you won't say that oh I shot for 20 years and I made nothing out of it there are people who have sunk for 20 years and made nothing out of it just because they didn't run it as a business they didn't have a management to you know control finance control HR control um, IT in terms of marketing and all those things, they weren't structures to, um, I mean, hold that into, uh, into. And then also, if you want to, we our business model is different because it's, you know, it's a team building, it's a team based something. But then in terms of individuals who want to pursue photography, I think that once you are building a team, you need to build a team to make you competent. And so you build a team around you to make you as the um, artist um, as a creative person very competent as compared to us we are building the team to scale up to get more numbers and so it's not to make me competent but it's to make us interdependent and then um, rather increase in terms of numbers and all those things so that will be my advice there are two di um, two different models and then you need to choose one so it's about you or it's about building a team and then everyone grows along so yeah Jama, thank you so much for having us it's has really been an eye-opening conversation 
This is where we draw the curtain for our interview with Gemma Photography, the team lead, Kweku Daku, who tells us that, I mean, if you want to go into photography, you should treat it as a profession, be professional about it, rather than seeing it as a hobby. And also, according to him, smartphone technology has rather been a boost to their business rather than being a downside of their business. I am Desmond from Pona, and thank you for watching a super interesting interview on Ghana Web TV. That's an interesting interview right there. But our friend Jefferson Seniaja is on standby to assist us with some helpful internet tools. <laughs> Hello there, my name is Jefferson Senior from After Music. This episode is for iPhone users. Well, I know we all want to use our iPhone for just phone calls and messages, but did you know that there is quite a lot that your iPhone can do? We're going to start this series trying to look for useful things that we can use with our phone and what it uh, enhances and what it entails and see how it benefits us in our everyday lives. Let's get on to it. So, welcome to our useful things to do on the iPhone. And the first thing I want to highlight is the Do Not Disturb button. Oftentimes, when we get into an unexpected meeting, we quickly put our phones on vibrate. And the problem with the vibration is sometimes it just ends up disturbing the meeting. There's a very cool tool that some people don't take advantage of, which is the Do Not Disturb button. And this button is right swipe, depending on the type of iPhone, you just swipe all the way from the top down. And it's that little crescent next to the padlock that looks like the moon. So once you click on that, totally do not disturb on. What this does is that once you are in do not disturb mode, everything, notification, phone calls are sent, but it doesn't sound. It doesn't make any noise and you get to work. Just even phone calls don't get through. So the best thing to always remember to turn it off when you are no longer busy because the problem is that if you don't turn it back on, you might miss some important calls. So it's a really, really great tool once you get into meetings, just swipe down, do not to step, and you stop all notifications, stop all phone calls from coming through. And if, even if they come through, you will get a message saying a phone call was missed. All right, so this is a great tool, do not disturb. And once you've done, you just turn it back off. You need it back on, you just turn it that and you get continue your way. This is great, try it out and let me know how it goes. So that's it for this week. I'll see you again next time. Bye for now. That's it for Tech Bits with Jefferson Seniaza, but we are moving straight to business headlines for the week. And we're starting with um, popular social media platform Twitter will establish its presence in Africa with a headquarters situated in Ghana with its founder, Jack Dorsey, has disclosed. Making the disclosure via Twitter on April 12th, Jack Dorsey wrote, Twitter is now present on the continent. Thank you, Ghana. And at Nana Ekufu Ado. Reacting to the news following a virtual meeting held between Ghana's President Ekufu Ado and Jack Dorsey on April 7th, the President said the decision to set up a, a headquarters is critical for Ghana's development in the technology sector. The choice of Ghana as HQ for Twitter's Africa operations is excellent news. Government and Ghanaians welcome very much this announcement and the confidence reposed in our country. Next is the ongoing Domso and Power 
cuts in the country. Executive Director for the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP, has disclosed that Ghana is currently losing 2.5 billion U.S. dollars as a result of the failure of government to fully utilize capacitor banks amid the current power crisis, according to Benjamin Boache, who was speaking on CTFM's Point of View program on Monday evening. Aside the financial savings that government could make, there was also an element of power that could be saved with full utilization of capacitor banks. The capacitor banks regulates that voltage to ensure that when the demand is rising, it is producing enough power. It provides the needed voltage when people turn on their equipment. You realize that the you realize that of the available installed capacitor banks, government's own record shows that only 28% was functional. He stressed that if governments were to improve it to about 70%, they will be able to save 35 megawatts of power at 90%. 38 megawatts of power will be saved. Next, Poultry farmers in the country have been urged to consider supplying their eggs and other perishable products to senior high schools across the country, but on a credit basis. This, according to the Chief Executive Officer of the National Food Buffer Stock Company Limited, Hanan Abdul Wahab, could be a good business opportunity for the farmers. Food is very, very important. And you, like, you also agree with me. Um, government business is not like private business where uh, payment and approvals can be done within a minute or within an hour. It's a process. It has to go through a process because we are actually spending public money. This is money for the good people of Ghana. We cannot just rush and start doing things. Buffer stock goes to supply and wait for 60 days before we are paid by the Ministry of Education. That is the arrangement we have with, uh, with the Ministry of Education on the free senior high school supply of the non-perishable food items. So I also encourage poultry farmers who have eggs and other products that want to do business with the schools. Since the schools are responsible for the buying, for the day-to-day -day buying of the perishable, that includes egg, to also go into same or similar arrangement with them so that they can give them on credit because the information we have also picked on the ground is that poultry farmers or egg suppliers wants to do cash and carry. And this is government business. You cannot do cash and carry with government. And later on... The Ministry of Finance has issued a disclaimer to media reports that have said that Ghana has been downgraded as a low-income country by the IMF in accordance with its latest fiscal monitor. This, according to a press statement from the ministry, is not accurate as the countries continue to be recognized as a lower middle income economy based on the widely recognized classification of the World Bank and the UN. Also, the statement insists the reference that was made to the latest International Monetary Fund fiscal monitor did not represent the findings therein, as Ghana's status did not change. The IMF fiscal monitor does not aspire as classifying countries by income level. Instead, it analyzes the latest public finance development, updates medium-term fiscal projections, and assesses policies to put public finances on a sustainable footing. The groupings of economists presented in the fiscal monitor's methodological and statistical appendix serve an analytical purpose only. In this appendix, Ghana is conveniently recognized as a low-income developing country, like other medium, like other middle-income economies, such as Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Nigeria, and others. Now on Galamse, President Nana Adodankwa Ekufu Ado on Wednesday, April 14, 2021, opened a two-day bipartisan consultative dialogue on small-scale mining in Accra with a call on participants to discuss issues relating to illegal small-scale mining, 
dispassionately, devoid of partisan politics, narrow and parochial interest. The president said it would require stakeholders in small-scale mining industry to engage in honest and candid conversations to stem the tide of the Galamse menace. He said although mining creates jobs and improved livelihoods, it should not be done at the expense of damaging the environment. The menace of illegal small-scale mining and the need to support and grow responsible small-scale mining. The aspects of our national life which are fair subject matters of partisan politics. We must, however, come to the understanding that small-scale mining and the requirement to do away with illegalities in that sector should be beyond partisan politics. Some subjects simply cannot be part of our everyday politicking, and I urge this forum to insist that illegal small-scale mining and matters relating to it should be one of such issues requiring national effort. Fellow Ghanaians, it is absolutely crucial that deliberations of this consultative dialogue be candid and devoid of partisanship or narrow parochial interests. Hopefully, at the end of the day, we should be able to build a broad-based national consensus around the necessity to stamp out the menace of illegal small-scale mining and the need to support and grow responsible small-scale mining. Employees of the Electricity Company of Ghana have begun a massive campaign to get their managing director, Kwame Ajimambudu, removed from office. This was after a National Executive Committee meeting held last Friday at the company's training school in Tema. In a strongly worded statement, the workers accused Mr. Ajimambudu of mismanaging the company's resources, adding that he is grossly deficient when it comes to matters relating to administrative and corporate governance. The staff also alleged that the MD has ignored several petitions to involve the company's rank and file in revenue mobilization since 2020. The workers say that the MD's continuous stay in office could collapse the state-run company as they further accuse him of procurement breaches. A clear example is the award of contracts of, of some six sub substations where the recommendations of the evaluation committee were sidestepped and awarded to other companies, the staff said in a memo. The union decries the alarming rates at which the company's technical and commercial losses are galloping. A conservative estimate puts the current system loss figure at over 34% as of February 2021. And there are no consent strategies in place to bring them down in the short and medium term. The statement further added. <laughs> That's it for this week's edition of Best Tech on Ghana Web TV. We are glad you made time with us. Log on to www.ghanaweb.com for more of our news stories. Get interactive with us on all our social media platforms. We are at the Ghana Web on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Ghana Web TV. My name is Na Oyokoti. Have a great weekend. <music>